But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard, when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And they went out and said to her, and she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. They got blessed in his word. Let's pray. Father, we, we commit this time to you now to, to bless us as we seek to study your word, to understand it more clearly, to be able to live it out. And uh, Lord, apart from your grace, we can't. It is all by your grace that we believe and obey. And uh, so, Father, uh, commit to you. Bless us now. And we pray this in Christ's name. Perhaps you've heard the story by Hans Christian Andersen called The Emperor's New Clothes. It's about an emperor, a king, who is very obsessed with his clothes, spending all of his time on what he will wear instead of the pressing needs of his kingdom. And so then one day, two swindlers arrived in the capital, and they posed themselves as cloth weavers. And they offered to supply the king with some magnificent clothes. But they explained that these clothes are invisible to those who are stupid or incompetent. Well, the king loves clothes, so he hires them. And they set up looms and they go to work. Then a succession of officials. And then the king himself visits the weavers to check on their progress. And each sees that the, the looms appear empty, but they pretend to see cloth being made because, according to the weavers, only fools can't see it. Finally, the weavers report that the king's suit is finished. And so they come and they pretend to dress him. They, they mime it and even tell him they're, they're so light that he can't even feel it. And the king goes along with it because, again, he doesn't want to admit he doesn't see it, and therefore admit so he then sets off in a procession before the whole city. No clothes on. The townsfolk uncomfortably go along with the pretending as well because you know, they don't want to admit that they're stupid either. Finally, a child blurts out the words, but he doesn't have anything on at all. And the people then realize everyone has been fooled. The king, having realized the truth himself, tries to play it off by continuing his procession through the capital, walking more proudly than ever. It's a humorous story of the foolishness of a pretentious king. But what happens when the joke isn't just on the king? What happens when the folly of a king hurts the people he rules? Well, our passage today is about a very foolish king and his foolishness that brings to an end the life of John the Baptist. According to Jesus, the greatest prophet who ever lived. We're not really, we've not really heard anything from John the Baptist directly since chapter 1. There we are told that he was arrested just as Jesus' ministry is getting started. But we are not, what we are not told are any of the circumstances surrounding his arrest. 
but now it's explained in what ultimately happened to him. Now having sandwiched John's death in the middle of Jesus sending out his twelve disciples on a mission trip, it appears that Mark is using John's example ultimately to give us a lesson in the cost of following Christ. And so that is our theme this morning, the fate of God's servants, the fate of God's servants. And we will see that, uh, first, we'll see that first by looking at the fate of John the Baptist, and then how John's fate points to Jesus' fate, and then how Jesus' fate points to ours. So those are our three points today. And so we begin with John. In verse 14, we read that King Herod heard about what was going on with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus' fame was continuing to grow. Jesus had given his disciples power to, to go out and preach and heal in his name. And so that helped Jesus' fame to grow even more. Uh, the King Herod mentioned here, let me say, is the son of King, uh, King Herod that we are familiar with in the Christmas story. When he died, the area that he governed under the authority of the Roman Empire was divided among four of his sons. And the heir of Mark VI is the son who was given the area that contained Galilee. He's also the heir that Jesus stands before on the day of his crucifixion because Herod had, had come to Jerusalem at that time. And so Pilate heard about it and heard that Jesus was from Galilee. So he tried to pass off the responsibility of trying Jesus to Herod. And so here in chapter 6, though, Mark informs us that Jesus is getting the attention of the top political leaders now. And then Mark gives us a brief synopsis of the popular opinion of Jesus at this point. Some think, he, some think that he's actually John the Baptist who has been raised from the dead. And that's why Jesus is able to do all these miracles. There was a popular belief back then that a very good person or a very evil person could come back from the dead and do miraculous powers. And so some had come to this conclusion about Jesus. Others, according to verse 15, believed that Jesus was Elijah, who had also come back. Of course, you know from, from the Old Testament that Elijah doesn't die. He's taken up in a, in a, in a whirlwind, uh, on a chariot of fire. And so there's not a record of his death. And so Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, talks about Elijah coming back just before the day of the Lord when God will restore his sovereign rule again in, in this world. And so some are thinking that maybe this is Jesus. Jesus will later tell us in Mark that actually Malachi 4 is, is pointing to, to John. John is the Elijah that was to come. So, but anyway, some think Jesus is Elijah come back. And others think he is just a great prophet. He is one of the prophets of old that is respected from the Old Testament. He's another one who has come in that long history. But the interesting thing is verse 16, where it says that Herod believed the first option, that Jesus was John come back from the dead. And then verses 17 through 28 give us the reason why he believed it. Herod believed John to be a truly good man, a righteous and holy man, according to verse 20. And he knew that he was responsible for his death. And so Mark then gives us all the nasty details of what happened. It started according to verse 17 with a scandal. Herod had taken his own brother Philip's wife, Herodias, as his own wife. And so according to verse 18, John had publicly come out and denounced it as sinful and wrong. So Herodias didn't like being accused of being an immoral woman in front of the public. So she nursed a grudge and wanted John put to death. And the only reason it didn't happen immediately is because Herod feared John as a man of God and couldn't go through it. So Herodias had to wait and look for an opportunity. And so she finally got that opportunity in verse 21, when Herod had a big birthday celebration for himself. And he invited all the influential people in his district. And Herodias then, as part of her plan, she marches her own daughter out before Herod and all the guests to dance. Now we're left to our own imagination of what kind of dancing it was. 
in light of the reputation that Herod and Herodias had, you know, we can have some, some thoughts on that. But regardless, it impresses Herod very much. And so he promises to give her whatever she wants. Now, we can't see it in the English, but in the Greek, she goes back to her mother and asks her mother what, what she should ask for. And the Greek is very dramatic. Upon her mother, mother's request, her, the, the daughter comes back quickly, almost with a glee, and says, literally, I want you to give me at once on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. Herodias' daughter is able to communicate how personal this is for her mother. And it says that Herod was exceedingly sorry, grieving over this. But there was one more thing that Herod would have been more sorry for if he had lost it. His own reputation and embarrassment in front of all his guests if he had not fulfilled that promise to them. He would have looked weak before John the Baptist and perhaps jeopardized his position of leadership. And so he sends the execution who brought John's head back on a platter and gave it to the girl who then gave it to her mother. And that is the shameful way the greatest prophet who ever lived That then brings us to the two parallels Mark gives us of John's death. The first parallel is Jesus. We get a clue of that, uh, that at the beginning of the passage in verses 14 through 16. The passage begins with who people think Jesus is, as we just mentioned. And Herod thinks, he says he thinks he is John. And then the rest of the passage is kind of like saying, not quite, but there are certainly parallels. Like, for instance, John, like John, Jesus will face his own death for preaching the truth and calling people to repent of their sins and turn to God. For John, it would come at the hands of Herod, a Roman puppet. For Jesus, it would come at the hands of Pilate, another Roman puppet who had jurisdiction over Jerusalem, where Jesus was arrested. Like Herod, who feared John and knew him to be a righteous, holy man, so Pilate feared Jesus and knew that he was, he was innocent and did not deserve death. But in the case of John, there was a third party, Herod's wife, Herodias, who held a grudge against John and schemed to have him put to death by using and manipulating a fourth party, her daughter. In the same way, there was a third party, the religious leaders, that schemed against Jesus and forced Pilate's hand by manipulating the fourth party, the crowd. And as Herod felt pressure to save face, so Pilate felt that kind of pressure to hold on to his position. And just as John the Baptist was unjustly arrested and tried by ungodly people and handed over to be executed, so was Jesus. And as we see in verse 29, just as John's disciples came at perhaps great risk to themselves and collected his body and laid him in a tomb, so would Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two very prominent Jews, come to collect Jesus' body in great risk to themselves, exposing that they too were disciples and laid him in a tomb. But, unlike John the Baptist, Jesus doesn't stay in the grave. Ultimately, a great man, ultimately as great of a man as John was, he was still a sinner. Romans 3.23 says that everyone has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. Short of God's standard. And because of that, we all deserve death and God's eternal judgment. The scriptures teach that there is a day appointed for all people to die. Even, even when, like in John's case, it's not of natural causes. It is ultimately what we all deserve. But in the case of Jesus, he did not fall short of the glory of God. He lived a perfect, righteous life. And so his death was not ultimately a result of his own sin, but the result of him dying purposely as a substitute for all of our sin. He died to take away sin, to save us from our eternal death and separation from God. And Jesus invites us then, the worst of sinners, to believe on him, 
and what He did for us. To trust that what He did for us provides us with God's complete forgiveness and His unconditional love. So, if you're not a Christian, meaning that this is all sounds brand new to you, or you thought you knew, you, th you thought you, you were a Christian, but now you realize maybe that you just do a few facts and were otherwise kind of apathetic to it all. Well, the call to you today is to believe on Him, to believe on Jesus. If John the Baptist needed a Savior, so did he. And, and, and come, talk to me or another member after the service so we can help you further in your new life in Christ. But that then brings us to the second parallel. And we find that parallel in verse 30. It's John's disciples are buried, are buried here. Jesus' disciples return from their mission trip and report to Jesus all that they had done and taught. Clearly from what we read in verse 14, the disciples had success. Jesus' fame grew through them preaching in his name. And so it's like these two very contrasting events. The tragic death of John and, 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 and the victories of the twelve are like passing in the night. Familiar, yet quickly heading in different directions. But folks, that is not Mark's point here. His point is to show that just as John's suffering was pointing to Jesus' suffering, so Jesus' suffering was pointing to the future suffering of those who follow him, us. John suffered for standing for righteousness, and Jesus suffered for righteousness. So are those who follow Jesus. Of course, Jesus promises these things elsewhere. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house, the elsewhere, prince of demons, how much more will they malign those of his household? And so, if we go back through the text, we see lessons for us, folks, in what John faced. If John is to be a parallel for us as we follow Christ, we see some lessons here that we need to take note of. First, notice the kinds of people we will encounter as we minister the gospel. First of all, we encounter some who completely reject our message. And, 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 and because we preach it, they will despise us. We see this, of course, with Herodias. She cannot see that what John was ultimately doing was loving and for her good. Her life and morality was in direct contradiction to God's law. If she did not repent and turn from it, then she would face not just the embarrassment of a preacher's rebuke, but the eternal punishment of God. But so many in the world are unable to see this truth. And they lash out at anger and bitterness that we would tell them such things. The truth of our words, no matter how loving and tender we make them, cause bitterness and scorn. In some settings, that scorn could have physical ramifications. We saw some of this in our time in Bangladesh. But in other places like postmodern America, it may be slander or the cutting off of friendships. So we need to understand this, folks. We can't always avoid conflict. If we are going to be faithful to Christ, if we are going to be concerned about the, 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 the eternal state of our family and friends or whoever we come across, no matter how kind we are, no matter, no matter how nice we are, no matter how loving we seek to be, we can't avoid the reaction that some people are going to give. What we need to be careful of that we, that we, that we, also, don't, that we, that we also make sure we avoid is, is that we don't keep our mouths shut and, and avoid sharing with people 
cause of our fear of this type of rejection. We have been called to this work if we follow Jesus Christ. Then there are others who actually receive the message of the gospel with some delight. They enjoy listening to some extent, much like we see with Gary here. But there's much they are not able to understand nor accept. And so there's, 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 there's much they like, but the key with them is that it must always be on their own terms. Herod would call John, and he would listen to him, but then he would send him away again into his cell until he wanted to listen to him again. And of course, ultimately, even though he seemed to even care for John to some extent, there are certain things that people like Herod are not willing to sacrifice. And so if those things are threatened, then they're out. So what, so, what they, they may, so what that may look like in our culture is someone who wants to be considered a Christian, but is very careful in how much they commit. They may, they may join a church even, but the church can't be too imposing. It's, uh, if, they, if, if they get too much into my business, I'm out of here kind of thing. They'll even label a church like, like that a cult. A church that would, 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 would seek to get involved in someone's life in any way. That they want to keep them at arm's length. If they come any closer, then they accuse them of being something like a cult. Their attitude is that a church has to allow me to continue to feel very comfortable in the world. Not demanding a big difference between my faith and the cultural trends. I can be encouraged at church, but not uncomfortably challenged. <coughs> now, there are two responses to that I want us to consider. One is that we shouldn't just throw the Herods under the bus and lump them in with the, Hero with the Herodiuses. Sure, they are the lukewarm kind of people that Jesus says he can spit out of his mouth. But think about John here and his attitude. Why did he keep preaching to Herod after Herod had put him in jail? Well, obviously one reason was that Herod was willing to keep listening. But secondly, was it not that he had hope that he might still change? Not just change, but believe. To believe the gospel. Herod's problem was that he couldn't trust God to be as good as John made him out to be. It sounded good to Herod, the words that, you, that, uh, that John was, was, was sharing with him, but in Herod's thinking, there was no way God could be good enough to make all the things, to, to make, make up for all the things that Herod desired, like women who belonged to another man. And so in a sense, Herod was trying to hold out hope for both God and the world until Herodias ripped it away from him and made him choose. So he chose the world. But I think, folks, we have to keep holding out hope for those folks that God will give them grace to see how much better he really is than the things that they keep holding on to. And here's the thing, too. Even if that person, that Herod type person, doesn't ever believe. You know, the thing is, is some positive things still came out of this. Herod kept John alive for a while. I, you know, I've shared the gospel with people before who didn't never accept it. But they seemed strangely warm to me afterwards and wanted to be my friend and even help me out on things. And the reality is, folks, is God will actually use unbelievers. For good purposes. He does it all the time. And I'm afraid that our culture today is so polarized that we are losing our ability to be a friend to those we disagree with. And Christians should be lead the way in being that example and not, not bringing unnecessary persecution our way. But having said that, we need to remember the other thing we need to remember about people like Herod, is that we can't put hope in the Herods of the world. We can sometimes befriend people who are friendly to our faith, and we put a ton of hope in them for becoming a believer. And so we can even start treating them like they're already a believer without them ever truly committing themselves to Christ. We try to get them in church or some Bible study 
and assume they are a Christian. But they're not. And again, they will prove it when the choice comes down between Jesus and their gods. They will always choose their gods. Like worldliness. I'd really like to commit to Jesus, but I don't want to miss out on the nice things of life. Or relationships. I, I love Jesus, but I don't want to be alone. And this person really likes me, and they said that we could find a church together that we could both agree on. And obviously, giving up those things for Jesus wouldn't be easy. But that brings us to our second subpoint here, folks. It's worth it. It's worth it. We need to look one last time at what happened to John and how it parallels to us as the disciples of Christ. Jesus says in Luke 7, verse 28, Among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet his last days were in jail at the mercy of Herod, a narcissist, and the last memory of him is his head on a platter held by the harlot Herodias. And all the cause, John was faithfully and then we have Jesus' disciples strolling in in verse 30, all excited to report to Jesus about all that had happened on their mission trip. And the subtle hint here is that if you follow Jesus, it's not going to be a bed of roses, but a sacrifice like John the Baptist. You don't typically live in palaces and live lives of sensuality like here. You live lives of sacrifice like John and Jesus. In light of this, I, I was reminded of a, a sermon that was preached by John Piper at a conference uh, mainly of college students back in 2000. And in that sermon, he first told how two women from his church, both around 80 years old, one was a widow, the other one had never married. They were serving as missionaries in the country of Cameroon when their car lost its brakes and they went over a cliff and died. Then he asked if that was a tragedy, saying, two lives driven by one great vision spent in unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of Jesus Christ. And then he says, that's not a tragedy. It's glory. And then he said he would tell us about a tragedy. He then goes on to read an article from the Reader's Digest magazine from 1998 which said this, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot troller, play softball, and collect seashells. Then he says, the American dream, come to the end of your life your one and only life, and let the last great work before you, before you give an account to, to your Creator, be this. I collected shields. See my shields. And then he says in fact, that's tragedy. Folks, the life of John the Baptist was not It was worth it. A, a life like Herod's is tragic. But a life like John the Baptist is glory. And it's the kind of life Jesus calls all his people to live. And we can trust that no matter what foolish people they try to do to us, we have a good and faithful Savior who will one day restore whatever is done to our lives and put a crown.
crown on our heads to rule with Christ. That is the, the promise. That is the hope. That is the life that we are called Heavenly Father, praise you and thank you for the life of John the Baptist. The grace you put out of him to be willing to be able to forsake the things of this life, the comforts of this life, to speak the truth, to preach your word to those around him, and even face face death with courage. And of course, he was the forerunner of our Savior who would give his life. But it would be not only to reveal you, but to save us from our sins. We know that in following Christ, we are to follow him and, and, uh, and that we too must embrace uh, that we live in a, in a world that is in rebellion against you and, and will often respond harshly to us as they seek to hold on to their gods, hold on to their sin. But Father, we also are promised that you give, you give grace, you give power as we, as we proclaim your gospel. As you change hearts and draw people to you. So, Father, we, we ask, Lord, you give us grace to count the cost, but then respond in faith and obedience. That, we would, that you would sober us up, Father. We confess that we have oftentimes become drunk on this world, the pleasures of this world been distracted and led, led astray. We've not been a good witness for you. So Father, give us grace to repent of that. Give us grace, Father, to see the, the glory of a life that might end in beheading or dying at 80 off a cliff in Cameroon. so much more to live for than the pleasures of a title. Our, we, have, we, have, we have a rest coming for us forever. Give us grace to live for that time. Give our young people grace to, to plan their lives out now to, to commit themselves to, to make decisions that will that will give them the utmost, greatest uh, reward and greatest uh, effect on, on, on those around you and your kingdom. God, again, we confess we get so distracted by the things of this world. Even, even, even the difficult things, there's challenges always. But Father, Give us grace to live above, above it all to what you ultimately promised us and what you call us to. And again, for people who are here does not know you as Savior, God, give them grace to not die like Herodias or Herod, to ignore the reality of, of where they stand with you, that they would lay down their lives, they would, they would turn from their sin. And, and seeking to, to control their own lives. They would recognize who they are before you, their need for, for you to save them and forgive them of their sins, and they would, they would lay down their life and follow you. Father, 
upright of grace in a mighty way in this place right now. God calls us to be mindful of those around us when we leave this place. Those who are, are heading to a Christless eternity. God, wake us up. Wake us up, Father. That we might follow the example of John. And follow our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in His name.
Keep